Hey all, welcome back to the Drunk on Riding Stephen King Dissection Series, where we analyze, compare, and generally just sort of tear apart and review every single work from who may be the very best author living and breathing in our time. I don't, I, I'm, I'm failing to think of someone who might compare. I'm sure you probably aren't. Uh, in this episode, brought to you in part through the patronage of Arya North, we're going to dissect the 1982 novella Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, as well as this 1994 film adaptation you probably know a bit better, The Shawshank Redemption. Directed by a name you might also remember from a previous episode, Frank Darabont. We'll also touch on a 2009 stage play version while we're at it. But before we dig into any of those, we have to talk about the collection that Shawshank Redemption actually appeared in, Different Seasons. And before we do that, let me remind you that if you enjoy this episode, if you'd like to see more of it, please head on over to DrunkOnWriting.com where you can get exclusive videos, early access, and vote on what is new and upcoming. I really think you should head on over there. But let's talk different seasons, uh, which includes King's first four novellas, thematically connected, as the title might suggest, to the seasons, all four seasons. Uh, spring, in this case, uh, represented by Shawshank Redemption, which bears the subtitle Hope Springs Eternal. That wasn't the only point of the different seasons title, though. Uh, as King notes in the afterword to the collection. So people will get the idea that it's not about vampires or haunted hotels or anything like that. Because at this point in his career, King had been typed as a horror writer, which he says, he claims, wasn't, he, he didn't really mind. Because as he put it, uh, there are there's worse company to be had, which is probably fairly accurate. And uh, his books obviously sold. They sold rather well. But these stories, what's contained in different seasons, they're not horror. They touch on horror a little bit, but they're not horror. They're more, to put it bluntly, mainstream. And at that time, in 1982 and before when these were actually written, mainstream novellas, the market for them, had pretty much dried up and it, it never got any better. For those of you holding out hope, don't go writing a, a mainstream novella. Get that sucker to a novel or cut it down to a short story. Go one or the other because if you're an up-and-coming author, you're not going to get it done with a novella. Uh, maybe if you were, you know, J.K. Rowling, you could do that, but the rest of us schlubs, not so much. But thankfully, he was and is Stephen King. And that brings with it a sort of clout, a sort of uh, a, a sort of pizzazz. So he was able to convince his publishers and his agent to put this collection together, different seasons. And it, you know, it certainly helps to have an agent and a publishing house that really, truly believes in you, believes in your writing, believes in your sales. Now, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption wasn't the first of these stories to be written, even though it leads off the collection. In fact, it was the third book, the third novella in this collection to be written, and Stephen King hammered it out after finishing off The Dead Zone, which you might remember from a few episodes back. It was, that was a good book. Now, it's an interesting title, isn't it? Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption. Um, not nearly as simple as as the other stories contained in this collection, and sort of a, a combination of a movie star, a, uh, a prison name, and, I don't know, redemption. It, it's, it's a confusing title, and I get why they renamed it for the movie to just the Shawshank Redemption, because even before that came out, when they, were, when they announced that this was, was being done, there were people sending in their auditions and their resumes for the role of Rita Hayworth. I, I honestly just don't know about people. I really, truly don't. I spoke before, um, notably when we were covering Stephen King's Dance Macabre, his, his nonfiction collection about the history of horror writing, 
um, at least in the last century or so, whatever the time span was, I don't remember it offhand today, about how well read King is. And that's really played into his stories, where he's been inspired by the likes of H.P. Lovecraft, and as we talked about in the last video, J.R.R. Tolkien and Robert Browning. Well, for Shawshank, King seems to have done much of the same, and owes a good chunk of the plot to Leo Tolstoy. Specifically, his 1872 short story, God Sees the Truth But Waits. As far as I can tell, this hasn't been confirmed by King. You know, I haven't seen any actual confirmation, a spoken confirmation, or written confirmation from King anywhere. But uh, we do know that King has read at least one Tolstoy. He recommended what is perhaps Tolstoy's most famous work, War and Peace, in his updated reading list for writers in the 2010 edition of his nonfiction memoir on writing. So, you know, it's not totally out of possibilities that this is actually plausible. And reading Tolstoy's tale, which runs only about nine pages, and you can, you can find it online easily enough. I'll include a link, as always, in the description below. There really is a clear through line. In, in Tolstoy's story, for instance, um, an innocent merchant, uh, Aksionov, and I don't know if I'm saying that right, but that's how I'm going to say it. He's tried and serves time for murder in Siberia. I'm reading this off my little paper here so I get this right. Where he inevitably meets the man who set him up. That man is caught trying to dig a tunnel out of prison. He sneaks the dirt out in his boots. And the merchant, the innocent man, is given a chance at revenge. He doesn't take it. And the actual murderer is so touched by this that he confesses. Now, you can see the similarities here, right? I mean... They're, they're all kind of dredged out there. Specific details like carrying out the dirt in the boots. That's something that you, you, you look at and it's like, is that a coincidence? I, it's probably not. Now, the details might be reconfigured, might be jumbled a bit. And the ending is, of course, entirely different. Because in Tolstoy's book, the protagonist dies in prison after the world finds out that he's innocent. King's, of course, Andy Dufresne in the book, uh, has a very different fate. The world does not find out that he's innocent, and uh, he does not die in prison. We, we know that for certain. Perhaps this is the key that is, is the difference, though. Like, this is the reason that there is such a marked difference, because... In Tolstoy's to story, we're told, Aksionov wrote no more petitions, gave up all hope, and only prayed to God. But with King's story, you have to remember, hope springs eternal. And Andy Dufresne sh strives to prove that though the person can, lock can be locked up, the spirit can't. And so with, with a little luck, with a lot of tenacity, with, with some stubborn willingness to undergo this immense project, you don't have to spend your life in prison, even if you are thought to be guilty, even if the world finds you guilty. If you are innocent, you should and can get out by whatever means possible. Um, but maybe I shouldn't say that. Maybe that's the wrong message to convey here. I'm going to stick by it, though. You know what? I'm going to stick by it. And uh, th But also, I'm going to back it up a second because I think I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Uh, so Shawshank is told from the perspective of Red, who is he's writing a memoir of sorts about his friend Andy Dufresne. Now, Red is a guy who calls himself a guy who can get stuff for you. And you know what? I don't want to. I don't want to push foot around it. You know the Shawshank Redemption, and you know Red. Well, you know Morgan Freeman, <laughs> who was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Actor for his performance in the Shawshank Redemption. Though you know he didn't win. He did get a Golden Globe in the same category, though. So you know that's not that bad of a consolation prize. But what I'm driving at here is. 
I could not read a single sentence of Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, the novella that was written before the Shawshank Redemption, the film, was released, without hearing it in Morgan's Freeman, Morgan Freeman's voice in my head. Every single sentence was Morgan Freeman in my head, especially with, with quotes like this. And now I'm going to try here not to read them in Morgan Freeman's voice, but I I, I honestly can't promise anything because I'm probably going to slip up. So uh, here, uh, you know, let me pull a few quotes here. Have I rehabilitated myself, you ask? I don't even know what that word means, at least as far as prisons and corrections go. I think it's a politician's word. I, slipped, I don't know, I slipped a little bit of Morgan Freeman -y in there. Uh, but how about this quote? Yes, I think it would be fair to say I liked Andy from the first. But we'll get to the, the movie in more detail in just a second. For now, the novella, which going off the assumption that you have seen the movie, that you are at least aware of the movie, the novella goes, not so surprisingly, into a lot more detail and really gives us a more fleshed out look into life at Shawshank State Penitentiary. For instance, we go much further into the how Red gets things into the prison, his his sort of whole system. And while that's cool and all, I found the what he's been sneaking in far more interesting because you don't really see a whole lot of examples in the movie. Um, but, you know, just listen to these. There was one fellow who was in for raping a little girl and exposing himself to dozens of others. I got him three pieces of pink Vermont marble, and he did three lovely sculptures out of them. A baby, a boy of about 12, and a bearded young man. He called them the three ages of Jesus, and those pieces of sculpture are now in the parlor of a man who used to be governor of this state. And my personal favorite, because this would totally be me, I got three of those green milkshakes they serve at McDonald's around St. Paddy's Day for a crazy Irishman named O'Malley. Andy himself smuggles cash into the prison, which isn't touched on in the film, probably because of the manner in which he, he does it. Just, just listen to this. When they check you in at this hotel, one of the bellhops is obliged to bend you over and take a look up your works. But there are a lot of works, and, not to put too fine a point on it, a man who is really determined can get a fairly large item quite a ways up them, far enough to be out of sight, unless the bellhop you happen to draw is in the mood to pull on a rubber glove and go prospecting. Yes, bordering on the graphic there, and King, it should be noted, do, really does not shy away from the graphic within the story in any way, shape, or form, especially around the subject of, of rape, which, while implied in the movie, um, most definitely occurs within the story, unfortunately. There's also more of a sense of passing time within the novella. You know, for instance, in the in the movie, though they've consolidated the characters for, for characterization purposes and, and the cast and whatnot, and you see people start to go, well, they get some gray in their hair. Within the novella, there's a more pronounced turnover among the guards, among the wardens, uh, and among the prisoners. Warden Norton, in fact, who, while he oversees Annie's entire 19-year stay in the film, he's only the last of the wardens to oversee Annie's 27 years in prison in the novella, and he doesn't really have any part to play whatsoever in establishing the, shall we call it, the, the money laundering gig that Andy sets up, though he does benefit from it. Uh, and, uh, you know, speaking of Andy, this is the way that King describes him in the novella. He was a short and neat little man with sandy hair and small, clever hands. He wore gold-rimmed spectacles. His fingernails were always clipped and they were always cleaned. He looked as if he should have been wearing a tie. Not quite Tim Robbins there who played him in the adaptation and was described by Morgan's Red as a tall drink of water. But I can see it, especially given Robbins really conveys the, the emotional aspects of Andy. Except. You know, he doesn't drink in the movie. They make mention of that during the infamous beer scene. No thanks. Gave up drinking. Whereas the book Andy, he does drink. At least four times a year. Let me quote here. Andy Dufresne took just four drinks a year all the time I knew him. 
He would meet me in the exercise yard every year about a week before his birthday, and then again about two weeks before Christmas. On each occasion, he would arrange for a bottle of Jack Daniels. He bought it the way most cons arranged to buy their stuff. The slave wages they pay in here, plus a little of his own. Up until 1965, what you got for your time was a dime an hour. In 65, they raised it all the way up to a quarter. My commission on liquor was, and is, 10%. And when you add on that surcharge to the price of a fine sippin' whiskey like the Black Jack, you get an idea of how many hours of Andy Dufresne's sweat in the prison laundry was going to buy his four drinks a year. So, it should probably come as no surprise that the pairing for this particular novella is Jack Daniels. Although, I happen to buy Jack Daniels' Gentleman Jack because uh, Andy's a gentleman and so am I. <laughs> but, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't keep a straight face there. But Gentleman Jack is double mellowed Tennessee whiskey and it's very comparable to regular Jack Daniels. In fact, it looks like it, smells like it. But it's a lot smoother still has a definite bite on the back of the throat. It's going to kick your butt on the first couple of sips. But if you have a second sip, a little better. Throat's starting to numb. You can't go wrong with Jack Daniels. I'm not going to go out here and recommend it and say you should run out and buy some Gentleman Jack. You know what you're getting with Jack Daniels. It's a nice mid-tier sipping Tennessee whiskey. And it's always going to be enjoyable. Gentleman Jack is the next tier up from standard Jack Daniels. It's nothing extremely special, but it's good. And uh, a worthy pairing, I think, for this story. Now, I could have gone out and bought a really expensive Jack Daniels, but they don't have them in a small bottle that I could find. They only had them in a larger bottle, and I wasn't going to do that. Not especially for this one. Um, it would probably just make me talk more like Morgan Freeman if I actually did do that. And I don't want to do that. But, you know, speaking of Morgan Freeman, it's worth noting the the line that Morgan Freeman says in, in the movie about him being Irish. He, you know the one. Red. Name's Red. Red. Why do they call you that? Maybe it's because I'm Irish. Yeah, that one. Well, in the novella, Red is actually Irish. Or, at the very least, has red hair. I, mean, I guess you can have red hair and not be Irish. Is that true? I think maybe all redheads are Irish. I didn't really look into that. I don't know if that's... That's probably a Wikipedia article read. Uh, but, but there's a third main character in the book, in the novella. One that uh, obviously pops up in the movie, but isn't quite as prominent. Any guesses? You might be thinking, oh, I, I already mentioned the warden. Am I thinking of Hadley? No, no. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that you probably aren't going to get this, and I'm just going to come out and tell you. Well, it's Rita Hayworth. Rita Hayworth, the poster, that is. And I mean, there's a reason Rita Hayworth is mentioned in the title, because Rita Hayworth happens to be who is on the very first poster that Andy gets to cover his hole. <laughs> the hole that he's digging in his prison wall. Here's how that very first poster is described, the image on that poster. You may even remember the picture. I sure do. Rita is dressed, sort of, in a bathing suit, one hand behind her head, her eyes half-closed, those full, sulky lips parted. They called it Rita Hayworth, but they might as well have called it Woman in Heat. Now, I think I found the image Red's referring to in this little quote, but it's certainly not the one used in the film. And just like in the film, it isn't the last poster to hang in Andy's cell. Uh, let me pull another quote here. This one's a tad long, but it gives you, again, that essence, that time is... A lot of time is passing in this novella, despite it only being about 100 pages. Time rolls on. Rita Hayworth hung in Andy's cell until 1955, if I remember right. 
Then it was Marilyn Monroe, that picture from the seven-year itch where she's standing over a subway grating and the warm air is slipping her skirt up. Marilyn lasted until 1960, and she was considerably tattered about the edges when Andy replaced her with Jane Mansfield. Jane was, you should pardon the expression, a bust. After only a year or so, she was replaced with an English actress. Might have been Hazel Court, but I'm not sure. In 1966, that one came down and Raquel Welch went up for a record-breaking six-year engagement in Andy's cell. The last poster to hang there was a pretty country rock singer whose name was Linda Ronstadt. But what's the point of the posters anyway? I mean, obviously, they're there to cover Andy's escape attempt, the hole, the massive hole that he's digging through the wall with his rock hammer, which we'll touch on that in a minute. But why... Did they all need to be of women? You know, that was something that I, I kind of asked myself. Like, not that there's anything wrong with having a poster of, of a woman. I've had posters of women hanging up in my room, especially when I was like a teenager. But, you know, is it is it because in prison that was the poster that people had? Like, a, they had posters of women? Or, or was there something more to that? Was there a real appeal to having a woman there? Like, why not have a musician, a landscape, um, a piece of music, some... Something else, I don't know, like a, 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 this was the 50s, I don't know, like a Elvis Presley album cover or something like that. I don't know if that's the right time period, but around, you know, something like that. Well, this question did come up in the novella, in, a, in part, um, but, you know, let me pull another quote here. I asked him once what the posters meant to him, and he gave me a peculiar, surprise sort of look. Why, they mean the same thing to me as they do to most cons, I guess, he said. Freedom. You look at those pretty women and you feel like you could almost, not quite, but almost, step right through and be beside them. Be free. I guess that's why I always liked Raquel Welch the best. It wasn't just her, it was that beach she was standing on. It looked like she was down in Mexico somewhere, someplace quiet, where a man would be able to hear himself think. Didn't you ever feel that way about a picture read? That you can almost step right through it? Obviously, this helps uh, sort of foreshadow the tunnel as well as Andy's trip down to Mexico, his assumed trip down to Mexico in terms of the novella. And, you know, it, w it really, it wasn't the only bit of foreshadowing, but it really, it, it was just so delicately handled there that it just kind of took me by surprise. It's, Especially read, coming back and reading it a second time, like, now we, we know what the movie is about. We know the surprise turn. But you gotta remember, it, that's what it was. It was a surprise turn. It wasn't handled like that. It wasn't handled like you assumed something was going to happen. But uh, the, the other piece, another piece of, of foreshadowing happened when we're briefly introduced to the character Norma Den. The, the big half-breed Passamaquoddy, as Red calls him. I don't know what a Passamaquoddy is. I assume it's some Native American tribe, but I, I, I don't know. Um, but Norma Den shared the cell with Andy, something that doesn't happen in the movie. But at one point, Norma Den is talking to Red about sharing that cell, and he says, I was glad to go, me. Bad draft in that cell. All the time cold. He don't let nobody touch his things. That's okay. Nice man. Never made fun. A big draft. Now, as far as I'm aware, Norman Den is, is never mentioned in the movie. I don't think he's even a side character. And they never they don't ever give Andy a, a roommate. I mean, all of the cells are designed as singles. A deliberate choice as the cells in the Ohio State Reformatory, where they did much of the filming for the movie, were only along one wall and faced the windows. Those interior shots you see of the the inmates facing each other and, and the guards coming down the middle. Those are all on a soundstage, though the creepy scene of Elmo Blanche was filmed in the reformatory. Did I say roommate? Cellmate. Cellmate, sorry. But again, you know, removing that character plays into how they really consolidated the cast of characters for the movie, um, and really sort of streamline the story, much to its improvement, I would say. The Shawshank Redemption was released September 23rd, 1994, but really started off back in 1987, 
when Frank Darabont, who'd go on to direct and write the screenplay, purchased the rights for $5,000. Though King never cashed the check. In fact, he framed it and returned it to Frank Darabont following the Shawshank Redemption's release. It was rather nice of him, I'd say. You might remember Darabont from the short but powerful film The Woman in the Room, which we talked about way back in the Night Shift dissection. He'd also later direct The Green Mile and The Mist, and has film rights for both The Long Walk and something called The Monkey? I don't know that one, but I, you know, I guess I will find out soon, but The Long Walk? I would love to see The Long Walk on the big screen, on any screen, really, just any adaptation. I think that would be great. That'd be rather good. But anyways, back to uh, Shawshank. Uh, Darabont wrote the screenplay in uh, just about eight weeks, and he cited a number of influences on the style, from It's a Wonderful Life to Goodfellas. And although he planned to, and eventually would, direct the film, he almost passed it up. Because Rob Reiner, who at this point had already directed Stand By Me, an adaptation of another story from different seasons called The Body, he wanted to direct it, and he threw millions at Darabont for the chance to do it. Side note, Reiner planned to cast Tom Cruise as Andy and Harrison Ford as Red. I, I mean, wow. <laughs> what, a, what a different movie that would have been. Yeah, um, thankfully, Darabont passed, and with a $25 million production budget, we got the jewel that we have now, starring, as I mentioned, Morgan Freeman and Tim Robbins with, among others, Bob Grunton as Warden Norton, Clancy Brown as Captain Hadley, Mark Ralston as Boggs Diamond, and a special shout-out here to Brian Libby, who played Floyd. Maybe you also remember him from The Woman in the Room. Frank Darabont obviously did. Like I hinted, personally, I think the film is the better version of the Shawshank story. I like that there's a chief antagonist, a smaller cast of characters, and added ambiguity to Andy's guilt. New, surprising, emotionally evocative moments that really probably wouldn't translate as well on paper. And generally, no open endings. Not for Hadley, not for Norton, not for Tommy, nor Boggs, or Brooks, or maybe most importantly, Red, whose story in King's novella ends this way. I hope Andy is down there. I hope I can make it across the border. I hope to see my friend and shake his hand. I hope the Pacific is as blue as it has been in my dreams. I hope. Yes, I definitely like the movie version more, and while there are no real standouts to me in terms of visuals, you know, the, the movie's relatively cleanly and plainly shot, there are several scenes unique to the film that I would argue are the story's best. Other than the beer drinking on the roof bit, obviously, which we touched on earlier, and which was lifted directly from the novella, that scene, along with the events leading to it, is perfection in either form. But consider the fresh fish scene. That's basically entirely new and features a cameo from Morgan Freeman's oldest son, Alfonso, who also doubled for the Young Red's mugshot. Also consider the extended bit about tax season and the ending involving the Randall Stevens double life. Quick side note about that. It's built on this exposition heavy scene between Red and Andy from the book in which Andy details at great length this fund that a friend of his, a, a friend from the war, one of his war buddies, set up for him. And that's another thing that's really not touched on in the film in any way, shape, or form. In fact, it's almost sort of danced around the, the war. Like, it's just not there. It happened, obviously, but there's, I don't think there's any mention. And there's only the one real mention of it in the novella. But uh, anyway, in the, in the novella, that scene... It's a bit awkward and kind of just, it's really slow. It's it just, it's not fun. And I think that the, the movie really managed to clean it up, the, the way that they presented uh, as a conversation while restocking the library books. But 
Andy's pseudonym in King's story is Peter Stevens, not Randall Stevens. You know, this gave me a little bit of pause after reading it, and I was, I was wondering to myself, why would he name, why would he change the pseudonym to Randall? What is he driving at here? What's, it, what's the point? Did, is, stick with me here, is Frank Darabont doing an homage to Randall Flagg? Is this a somewhat of a veiled reference to Randall Flagg, the, the man in black? Is there, is there, you know, a deeper, darker connection there, a, a sort of subtext owing Andy's darkest parts of his nature to Flagg? I mean, is, is that possible that Darabont set up this sort of connection? You know, I, I bet there's a there's a really good dissertation in there, especially because I've never heard this theory posted before, and I, and I didn't see anything on the internet about there. So, you know, I, I bet there's there's an argument to be made about that that Shawshank Redemption has a connection to Randall Flagg, just as so many other pieces of Stephen King's universe do. But, uh, you know, back, back to those scenes I was talking about. There was also that, that touching deep dive into Brooks trying to manage on the outside. You know, him carving his name and Red later adding to it gets me every single time. I just, I, I just can't watch that without, like, tearing up and, and thinking how awful that is. How that's such an indictment of the prison system as it stands, or at least as it stood, you know, seven years ago. Same with the, the record-playing scene. That's just such a touching one. Andy's face there, the, the prisoners all looking, listening on in, in stoic bewilderment, further clarifying the concept of hope, of, as Andy puts it, the something inside that they can't touch. Magnificent. That was Mozart's Duettina Sol Aria, by the way, from The Marriage of Figaro. And the song is about a love letter written to expose infidelity. Quite an interesting choice for this movie. And when, when, when Andy turned the volume up, which was a contribution from Tim Robbins, I should point out, oh my god, the joy is just, the joy in his face is palpable. All those great scenes, and that's not even mentioning the film's replay factor. Now, a lot of movies, a lot of books, when they have that sort of twist, the sort of twist that Shawshank Redemption does, it loses something in repeat viewing. Christopher Nolan's Memento, for me, is a perfect example. Watching this the other night with my wife, and I, I, I've seen this movie dozens of times, but, but why, it, it's been a bit, so watching this, knowing how it ends... I found myself starting to get really stressed out. The scene in which Andy's cell is tossed, I, I realized perhaps for the first time that the rock hammer was in the Bible the warden handles and keeps referring to. And the poster he questions, the escape tunnel is right behind it. Any misstep, any stroke of bad luck, if the warden just so happened to want to flip through and look at a passage, Andy's plans would have crumbled right then and there. And here, first-time viewers think he's sweating a rock cloth. I mean, <laughs> I envy first-timers because that, that twist, it's handled so well. That portion of the film is framed to heavily imply Andy's going to off himself. And then as if he has, only for the rug to be pulled out from under us. It is expertly handled, even if the trailer sort of spoiled it. Get busy living, or get busy dying. That's damn right. Now, there are stories out there about disagreements between Darabont and the cast, such as Freeman wondering why that ball-tossing scene at the beginning took nine hours to film and others about issues between Darabont and the producers, and post-production edits, and unfilmed scenes, including one in which Red is dreaming and gets sucked into the Rita Hayworth poster. Yeah. But there are countless books and articles about those, and honestly, I think they're basically things that happen with every movie, every, every production, so I'm not really going to dwell on them or go into them here. But what I will talk about, 
what I, what I do want want to sort of uh, go over right now is the fact that when marketing this title, they generally did not use Stephen King's name. It only appears in the credits in both the trailer and the poster. Sort of blink and you'll miss them name drops really because they feared that the audience they were trying to pull in with the Shawshank Redemption would bulk at going to see it if it if they knew it was a Stephen, if it was based on a Stephen King story because as you know, as I said before, Stephen King had been typed as a horror writer. And this certainly didn't look like a horror story now, did it? Was no one there at the time to explain the irony in all of this? Like, could no one have handed them a copy of King's Afterward? Not even the whole book, just the afterword. Though, to be fair, Stand By Me pulled the same strategy, and when advertising apt pupil a few years later, King was only sort of softly mentioned. What can I say? We've come a long way. Joke's on them, though. Uh, despite generally positive reviews, the movie earned just $16 million in its opening theatrical run. A verifiable box office bomb. Doesn't help much that it was going against two absolute juggernauts in Forrest Gump and Pulp Fiction. Though after the Oscar nods, the many Oscar nods, Shawshank was, got sort of a re-release and finished its entire run with $58.3 million in the bank. Uh, still, it wasn't until after an aggressive uh, rental market push. Yeah, you remember that one? The whole wall would be one movie at Blockbuster. I remember those days. But yeah, they, 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 really, they were very aggressive in setting out copies of Shawshank and even later had record-breaking airings on TNT. And it was really a combination of those two moves that established Shawshank as the cult classic and then simply classic that we know it as today. Now, while I'm still sort of uh, awaiting the inevitable remake because you know it's going to happen at some point and it's, I don't see how it could possibly be any better, but uh, it, it will happen. It's worth pointing out that the film version helped sort of inspire the 2009 dramatization for the Gaty Theater in Dublin by Dave Johns and Owen O'Neill, which made its way to Kansas City, Missouri just this past April. Though it's, uh, it's only clearly inspired visually, because according to the playwright, they were only allowed to use material contained in the original text, not the film. Still, I have a Ticketmaster alert for when it comes to the New York area because I don't want to miss it. I would love to see that. I really would. Um, and of course, you know, Shawshank Redemption has been satirized up the wazoo. I think, I think my personal favorite has to be the one from Family Guy. When I got out of Shawshank, there was only one thing on my mind. A promise I made to a friend that I had to keep. Walk along the stone wall until you reach the tree, and that's where you'll find the rock. Dear Red, if you've come this far, maybe you're willing to go a little further. You remember the name of the town in Mexico, right? Crap! What? Oh, oh, is that him? Is it? No, no, beach dog. And before we go, one funny note on the ending. That tree, the, the one in the field Red goes to, it came to be known as the Shawshank tree. It was, a, it was a white oak near Malabar Farm State Park in Lucas, Ohio, not Maine, clearly, and sadly saw its last sunrise in July 2016 after getting hit by lightning, eaten by ants, and knocked down by winds. It was then turned into gift plaques for the stars of the film, along with an assortment of other collector's items and 25th anniversary souvenirs. Not gonna lie, I really wish I had that pen. But given, you know, the tree was about 200 years old, 
I bet it had a hell of a life. I bet if it could talk, it would come out with some rather insane stories. Probably something even more insane than Stephen King could come up with. And, uh, you know, speaking of which, I have one question that kind of was bothering me toward generally the latter half of Shawshank Redemption in both forms. And, you know, maybe some lawyer out there listening to this can, can sort of help me out. But um, what was Andy's plan if he got probation? Could, could somebody enlighten me on that? Like, if he actually did manage to get the retrial and he was found innocent and they let him go, how is he going to explain the giant hole in the wall? I mean, w would, would they just simply look at him and be like, oh, yeah... Okay, well, you were innocent, and you were taking advantage of your opportunity to try to get out. We understand that. We're just going to bill you for the repair. Is that what they would do? I mean, I feel like that's a crime. I feel like maybe it would add to his sentence. You know, it, it was funny because Red actually wonders the same thing in the novella. I don't think it's, it's mentioned in the movie. But uh, here's what he has to say about it. The most ghastly irony I can think of would have been if he had been offered a parole. Can you imagine it? Three days before the parolee is actually released, he is transferred into the light security wing to undergo a complete physical and a battery of vocational tests. While he's there, his old cell is completely cleaned out. Instead of getting parole, Andy would have gotten a long turn downstairs in solitary followed by some more time upstairs, but in a different cell. I kind of, you know, would have loved following that storyline and see where that goes. I mean, today, if that happened and news got out, you know, people would be calling for his immediate release. Be like, oh, this was an innocent man. He was just trying to get out. He'd probably end up with his own reality show, like flipping houses or something. I don't know. I, I think that would be just a great storyline to uncover. <laughs> but I'm just I'm gonna leave it at that and just say uh, that this has been the drunk on writing dissection of Stephen King's novella, his very first novella that is published at least, Rita Hayworth and Shawshank Redemption, as well as the film adaptation The Shawshank Redemption. Which, if you haven't watched it at this point, please for the love of God just go watch it. It's a great piece of cinema and maybe, just maybe, the best Stephen King adaptation. I don't know. We'll touch on that one in a few more episodes. But next up, Apt Pupil. A story I've read but have never seen the adaptation of. So I'm kind of excited about that one. Um, remember, if you like this video, please be sure to subscribe. Please be sure to give it a thumbs up. Please recommend it to your friends. And please head on over to drunkonwriting.com and sign up and become a patron to access exclusive goodies, exclusive videos, vote on the content, to contribute to it, become part of the show. It's all fun. I love it. I love my patrons. And, uh, you know, regardless if you do that or not, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. Until next time, as always, cheers and keep on riding.